if you try to put Donald Trump into any other, you know, part of life, would would people, even conservatives in red states, would they want Donald Trump to be the coach of their kids' soccer team? They would they want Donald <laughs> people would not trust Donald Trump dog with their car keys if he were the valet in front of a restaurant. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is January 5th, 2024. We are five days into January, one day short of the third anniversary of the insurrection. Boy, that that that, that is a weird thing, isn't it? Uh, we're joined, of course, by Tom Nichols, Professor Tom Nichols from The Atlantic. So, I mean, three years ago, do you remember, do you remember where you were, what you were thinking was going to happen three years ago? Yeah, I, I remember this kind of um, growing feeling of unreality that this could not be my country. This could not be my, even before, these are not my even fellow before citizens doing this. Yeah. No, I remember I, I was actually looking at, uh, at my newsletter from January 5th and it was like, people, uh, stuff's coming. This is going to be really, really bad. I mean, there, every single light is, is blinking here. And yet, even with all the warnings, even with all of the, Hey, we should be really alarmed about this. The reality was so much worse. And of course, uh, here we are, three years later. So, hey, listen, I want to talk about a lot of things, um, you know, that, that are not involving Trump necessarily, if that's okay with you, Tom. Um, How is that we'll, possible? We, we, will, we will get to it, but I do want to talk about <laughs> some other stuff. Can we just start off by just going through some headlines that kind of are sticking sure. with me this morning? I mean, obviously, it's we wake fr- up it's today. It's Friday. It's the day for it. And it's, it's, the, it's the weekend. So, you know, we start off the day with this report that the U.S. economy created 216,000 jobs, which blew past expectations unexpectedly, wages up. So pretty good news Jeez. for people wondering whether, you know, how the economy would play out in 2024. Uh, it's hard to see this as, as, as bad news. Uh, we also got the uh, grift in plain sight story, the least surprising story of, of the day that Trump received millions of dollars from foreign governments as president report fines like because of course he did of course he did my shocked face we knew this and you know part of this is the this is the the the, one of those times when you feel like you're taking your crazy pill so you have republicans running around pretending that they're going to impeach joe biden because of the money that he got from china which they they can't actually connect the dots and here's here's donald trump over there you know, pocketing money from the Chinese gov- from the Chinese government, and it's like it, okay, so hypocrisy. None of this matters, right? None of this. I, I wonder matter. though. I, you know that story comes out. And I want, there's a part of me that says, did the Republicans really were they clever enough to say, you know, at some point? Because I mean, the, Trump taking money from foreign governments was like the worst kept secret in Washington right. all those years, right. right? I mean, everybody knew it was happening. The all, all that this report that you just mentioned all, all that did was simply kind of towed up um you yeah, know here's the, the receipts yeah, yeah yeah the receipts exactly just kind of adding up the receipts but everybody knew this was happening you almost have to wonder were the republicans clever enough to say hey let's kludge up some kind of bullshit joe biden takes money from yeah. china story so that when it breaks about how much money donald trump took from china we can either say, what about it? You know, what, what about, what about, what about, yeah, well, your guy did it too, or everybody does it, or that's not the real story. I mean, I, I, I hate to ever give this, I mean, you don't want to think that somebody like Jim Comer is actually clever. Um, but, but there almost seems like a kind of beautifully planned sort of, we know this is coming. Let's accuse Biden of it. Let's set up that whole hearing so that when it does come out, everybody shrugs and goes, eh, well, what are you going to okay, do? So everybody I, does. I, I, I don't, I, I think anytime you attribute, you know, deeply laid plans to any of these guys, is probably a little bit, uh, I, you that's know, my but, problem but, with the theory. But no, no, no. But, 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 but I think that theory is, is valid in the sense that um, this is part of the, the playbook of projection that whatever yes. you have done, you accuse the other guy of doing. So, yeah, there was a certain inevitability about all of this. OK, so th- that story, which I think should be a very, very big deal. I think that everybody should be talking about it. You know, go into your swing voter um, blue collar areas and say, you know, you know, who actually got money from China. Listen to this. OK, I don't know. It makes a difference. Um, one of my New Year's resolutions. Do you make New Year's resolutions, by the way, Tom? Uh, you know, as we were talking just before we went on, Charlie, I'm too old for any of that now. My New Year's resolution is to see another New Year's. 
Well, okay. See, I'm actually. I older don't than make you. them anymore. I just can't. I'm. I, you, other than the general, you know, um, I go to church at Christmas and mm-hmm. I make the general Christian pledge to be a better person next year. But no, I didn't make any resolutions. Mm. So what well, was yours? Are you doing dry January or anything like that? Oh, don't talk crazy. Wet, wet. Okay, wet, wet. So one of my New Year's resolutions was to use the word gormless more. Okay, <laughs> gormless. Which is it's an intelligent great, stupid. It's a perfectly cromulent word. It is. It's a wonderful word. And and so I, I in my in in morning shots this morning I have an update on the gormless GOP. How they're all falling into line. Uh, the gormless GOP leadership all falling into line behind Donald Trump. And again, this is one of those stories where you go, yeah, of course. But you go, wait, no, no, no. This, this is the third anniversary of when Donald Trump put those people, you know, their lives at risk under attack and every one of them. So what I linked to was the the headline from Business Insider. Trump gloated about Tom Emmer's endorsement after he derailed the top Republican speakership bid. They always bend the knee. See, there's always the there's the cravenness and then there's the humiliation. And Trump doesn't even pretend it's like, yeah, Tom Emmer, you could have been speaker. I kneecapped you a month ago. And here you are on your knees kissing the ring. Yep. Yep. Um, it is. It, but it, but I think the one thing <clears throat> people always have to bear in mind is that when guys like Tom Emmer kiss the ring or any yeah. warmer parts of Donald Trump, mm-hmm. um, they're not really sucking up to Trump. They're sucking up to a very small number of their own primary voters and saying, please, please, please don't kick me out of my Yeah, job. don't don't hurt me. Please just don't hurt me again. Okay, there's a lot of other things. Here's the my head is going to explode story of the day. You saw this out of Utah. The Deseret News did a survey about uh, who was a person of faith, and they found that. I knew you were is- going there. You had to do it. I mean, you know, and again, I, I'm not sure that the word means what people think it means. But, you know, most Republicans think that Donald Trump is a person of faith and they went into it. But you look at these numbers. Republicans, who is a person of faith? 64 percent say Donald Trump. 13 percent say Joe Biden. 34 percent, only 34 percent say Mitt Romney. So you have, you know, McKay Coppins. That's, who, that's who knows, yeah, that's 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 mass psychosis. I'm sorry. That's just, you know, that is head explodingly ridiculous. I mean, first of all, you know, whatever your other criticisms of Joe Biden, the guy is probably one of the most church going presidents yeah. we've had since maybe Jimmy Carter or, or Bush at least, or yeah. Bush 43 anyway. Um, but to say that Donald Trump is somehow more more a man of faith than Mitt freaking Romney. Um, you know, and I wonder, I, and I, I've, I, 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 with these polls, I just wonder if sometimes if people answer these polls and they say, this is basically a, um, proxy for asking me whether or not I like Donald Trump. Yeah, I'll vote. I think so. I, I, you know, I, I, because, I think, I think that because otherwise, otherwise it makes, it is mass psychosis. It, it, because then you're, then otherwise you're required to believe that a lot of very sensible people in, you know, across the country other let's say otherwise sensible people genuinely are you know so detached from reality that um they they need to have like a a, you know be be put into guardianship or something well what Um, again the the whole what is faith and you know this is part of the look i'm we're not breaking any new ground to say there's a little bit of a you know cult here have you seen this video you know God created Trump. God brought Trump. But I mean, part of this is when you look at Mitt Romney and you look at Donald Trump and realize that far more Republicans think that Donald Trump is a man of faith than Mitt Romney. I mean, th- that it may be a stand in for I like this guy. I don't like this guy. There's obviously also a little bit of an um, um, an element that I think I underestimated back in 2012, um, the antipathy to Mormonism. So, I mean, there is that mm-hmm. element there. So I don't know whether we... Yeah. But but to say that Donald Trump, even if there were nobody to compare him to, I know. Um, you know, the guy, is, I mean, this, you know, th- thrice married, lecherous, adulterous, um, serial you know, liar, serial liar um, guy who doesn't, you know, pay his debts, doesn't pay his workers. The, the idea that anybody would say this is, I mean, I get the people. I get, I don't agree with, but I get the people who say, well, he's our Cyrus. He's right. this evil guy that is right. somehow going to be the vessel 
of things that are, you know, that the war, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Mm. And this creepy guy is nonetheless somehow an instrument of God. But to say that he is a man of faith, I really who, think that's who almost turns like, the other cheek, a man yeah, of yeah, mercy it's like a, and forgiveness, right? <laughs> I, okay, it's just, it's just too much. But I, okay. but I wonder too if it's not just a proxy for I like Donald yeah. Trump, but a screw you to um, pollsters. Yeah, I, I, I know what you're really. I know what you're really asking me. So screw you. Yeah. By the way, I, man of faith. I, I I don't underestimate that as as a factor. Okay, so I want to talk about one of our big uh, culture war issues of the week. I don't know if it's culture war, but uh, let's talk about uh, what happened at Harvard and Claudine Gay. You had a piece about this. Um, Lots of, you know, this is one of those things that has has assumed a role in American politics and culture, you know, way out of proportion to the significance of the job of president of Harvard. I'm not saying it's not important, um, but this has become kind of a proxy fight. Now, I come to this as somebody that has been writing about higher education for more than 30 years. And it does feel as if, you know, this is a continuation of fights that we've had for many decades. However, and I want to get your take on this as a as an academic, as a recovering academic. It feels like there is a crisis in higher education that's coming to a head right now. I mean, just in the last month, you've had the resignation of, uh, you know, had the resignation of the president of the University of Pennsylvania, the president of Harvard, the president of Stanford was was forced out. You have the activism among the donors. Um, you have activism on the on the boards. M- a lot of pressure from conservative activists. So. Let's talk about um, the defenestration of Claudine Gay, because as you know, there are a lot of folks who believe that this was part of a right wing anti DEI plot by racists who targeted her because uh, they, she is a black woman. So, Tom, give me your take, um, because and I want to look at this from a number of different points of view, but 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 your take on the the uh, forced resignation of Claudine Gay from Harvard. This was part of a targeted campaign uh, uh, by the right wing against a hated sort of, you know, icon of DEI um, issues. But that doesn't change the reality that what those guys discovered was actual academic misconduct. And it shows you how much we've all been, you know, overtaken by the brain worms that we can't seem to hold those two realities in our head at the same time. There's a um, social media meme, like when the worst person in the world is right, yes, you know, right. and, and this is, the worst this is one of these just, moments, yep. the worst person in the world was behind this, but they were right. And that's hard. I think sometimes it's, to swallow. It's very hard. It's very hard because you feel like you're giving a really terrible person a win. Yeah. We're talking about Christopher um, but, Rufo you know, here, right? And and the release to Fanic and yeah. all the other yeah. all the other, you know, because look, part of the, the bad faith involved here is that the, the Rufos and Stefanics of the world, they don't they don't have any issue with elitism and Ivy League schools. Rufo constantly says, Hey, I went to Harvard. But he did he, he actually went to the Harvard Extension School yeah. where I taught for 18 years, yeah. by the way. Yeah. I love extension. I always made it a point. I when I wear my Harvard swag, mm-hmm. it says extension on it. It mm-hmm. does not say, you know, Harvard because extension for those folks, and I uh, Charlie, I hope you'll forgive me for 10 seconds on this, but um Harvard Extension is the open enrollment continuing education branch of Harvard. Right. It's the oldest, of course, like everything in Harvard, it's the oldest and best, right? Um, and I taught there and I was deeply proud of, of teaching there. And, you know, it's not people who go to extension, say I went to extension because they're right. very proud of that. They usually don't say, oh, I went to Harvard because, you didn't, you know, you weren't, you didn't go through the admission process. You weren't a day student. It wasn't the same, you know, say it's a, it's a, um, a part of Harvard university, but it's not the part of Harvard that most people understand as saying I went to Harvard. So with all that said, you know, guys like Rufo have no problem with Harvard being Harvard. they, they want they just don't happen to like the current elites who are in charge and think they should be the new elites in charge. So there's this kind of ugly resentment and status envy and yes, racism and sexism and all of that. None of that changes the reality that when they dredged up gay's work, there were things in it that by any standard and certainly by Harvard standards would have qualified 
as academic misconduct and likely plagiarism. So, you know, well, well this is what the, you wrote. You you wrote that, you know, Gay's resignation was overdue because she had, in fact, engaged in academic misconduct. And you wrote everything else about her case is irrelevant, including the silly claims of her right wing of opponents. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, what about you know, the when they said, well, say, she was kicked out because of what she said about Israel. She was kicked out about they got yeah. her. They, they managed to, you know. Um, put her head on, as a trophy on their wall because of yeah. DEI, you know, her scout, right. They, none of that is true. The thing that I think, you know, was that finally got to that point is, and he said, you know, this is enough of a problem with your academic record that you cannot continue as the public face of the most prestigious university in the world. And you brought up, you know, with, I mean, this is, I think, very different from the Liz McGill resignation where donors just said, mm -hmm. listen, you screwed the pooch. Yeah. That was a stupid thing to yeah. say. We don't want you as president anymore. Fine. That, you know, that's mm -hmm. universities are self-governing institutions and should be. Stanford, and I wrote about this, um, look mm -hmm. out, book plug coming in the new edition of The Death of Expertise. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote about Tessier Levine, in the, the president of Stanford. Again, a serious you know, record after a long investigation. Now, people said, why did Tessier Levine get a long, this long investigation and Gay got, you know, the boot? So Tessier Levine, um, his stuff was science. And that takes a little, you know, that takes a lot of kind of specialized digging about the data and which things were properly cited and which site, because he had you know, 14 co-authors and all that stuff. But in the end, he had to step down because you can't lead Stanford University after piling up a record of academic misconduct. And I think the inability, uh, you know, you and I were joking just before the show that, um, you know, apparently I've been re as a conservative in the eyes of many people on the left because of saying this. But what, what I'm really saying is that I spent 35 years teaching 18 of those at, at Harvard extension, a school for which I have immense mm -hmm. affection. Um, you know, in the end, yeah, it may, it may be that the worst person in the world that, you know, discovered this, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that there's a, there, there, it doesn't change the fact that well, there's and, a real and, and also, here. and also the stakes for Harvard were, were, I think high and, and for academia, I mean, you, you've written about the death of expertise. If, if these institutions, um, decide that they're going to die on this hill, then they are putting their own reputations on the line. They're putting their credibility on the line. Are they willing to torch their credibility, um, you know, on the altar of either identity politics or I, we're never going to concede that right wing news outlets or people like Christopher Rufo might have come up with something. Well, and, and what are you saying to your students? Yeah. Um, there was a guy, I can't, one of the people that she lifted stuff from or mm -hmm. borrowed or cited without yeah. attribution, you know, depending on what camp you're in, however you want to use it. He said, well, I don't think this is plagiarism. I don't have any problem with it. And, you know, the first thing I thought was, are you going to, is that what you're going to say to your students? Hey, Prof, well, see, here's a couple of paragraphs, here's yeah. a couple of paragraphs, no attribution, no question mark, no uh, quotation marks, no footnote. Um, you know, I'm not in trouble, am I? Because, you know, you said this is okay. Well, this is, this is a key point. And, and you made it in, in, in your piece that, you know, you had been a professor for 35 years and you would have referred students for similar misconduct and for varying punishment. So there's no doubt in your mind as an academic. Um, and I think it's pretty clear even from some of her defenders I, I, at Harvard, that if a Harvard student had done what she did, they would be in trouble. So, I mean, that, that, that becomes I kind of a bright line. In cases, I have become in involved in cases at least twice where I referred behavior like this on a student was expelled from two different institutions. Mm. So, you know, maybe I'm just, you know, old and cranky and hard line, but, um, you know, and I, and I, someone asked me on social media, oh, so she should be fired now from Harvard entirely. Um, my answer to that is that's an internal departmental decision right. that will take a lot longer to, to figure out. I, but as the public face of a major teaching and research institution, you know, um, one of my colleagues made in the Atlantic made the point that presidents, college presidents have to be, um, I either, in the best case, both, but either politicians or scholars of serious note. They have to be excellent politicians or major scholars. And and um, the point was, you know, gay right now is neither, um, you know, not able to make the case for being either of those. And and as you say, that's an institutional that's an institutional problem for Harvard. And I think it was the right decision all around for her, for Harvard, for everybody 
but we have become so tribal and so unwilling to 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 think about you know that again that the worst person you can think of could say something that could actually be true i mean look i i don't think i actually think that people like stefanik and rufo when it comes to all this dei stuff they they've peaked i mean they i i maybe i'm being overly optimistic about this but you know rufo's big thing was to hitch his star to ron desantis so you know how's that going well, see, I, <laughs> you know, well, yeah, uh, they I mean, managed to ruin some institutions in right. Florida. Um, but, you know, this is Harvard. There's still going to be a Harvard and it's still going to be one of the greatest universities on the planet. Yeah. Uh, you know, long after people have forgotten who Elise Stefanik or Chris Rufo are. Well, I think that's true. But I don't think that the controversy, this this tide has has, in fact, peaked because there there's there's a there's a larger problem. I mean, you you do have. Um, I mean, the politicization of higher education is is not a myth. It, it is true. It has been accelerating. Um, the illiberalism in academia is a real problem. And I think it's increasingly it, in tension with where the country is. Well, so let me get to that in a moment. So, for example, I mean, OK, let's go back to what. But Charlie, what can I make, let me, yeah, let me make ahead. one point about yeah. the DEI thing, Chris thing. You know, in a way, I think what happened to gay is almost a lagging indicator. Because it seems to me, you know, following this stuff, and remember, I only retired from teaching, um, you know, year, year and a half ago. Um, it seemed to me like a lot of the, um, you know, that the universities themselves w- had realized that things were out of control. I, th- I think back all the way to the, to the incident um, back, uh, it's got to be seven or eight years now, you know, with a bunch of kids screaming at Nicholas Christakis. Oh, I remember that, yeah. Remember, remember that? that, you know? I do. But, you know, about this is you're this is supposed to be a safe home for me, you know, not a place. Mm-hmm. And of course, poor, poor Christakis, you know, is saying, um, no, I don't agree with that. This is a university. It's got to be a, you know open place. Um, and, I, and I I almost feel like that was the high watermark of the insanity about a lot of this stuff and that a lot of the programs and a lot of the um Kind of the gobbledygook around this had started to recede back then because I think there were a lot of adults saying, "Hey, this is not a good idea. This is not yeah. the environment we tried to create." So, in a, in a sense, I almost feel like what you know the the, the La Faire gay you know is all about is kind of this. T- now, again, may I could be wrong, and yeah. maybe I am yeah. just you know being just wish casting here, mm-hmm. but it seems to me like all this is kind of tail ending a lot of stuff that to me seemed a lot worse. But one place where I don't think, where I do think I'm wrong is when it comes to this sudden outpouring of completely lunatic anti-Semitism on campuses. And that's, that's been the fire, you know, and and, and I think that's taken it to a different level of this. You and I know about, I also think it's a different thing. Yeah. You and I know about what happened at Yale in that particular incident. I don't disagree with you, except that I don't, don't think that penetrated into the larger public cons, uh, you know, consciousness. I don't think it triggered, you know, the, you know, the, the donor class and the action by boards of trustees. There were not the kinds of consequences that we're seeing now. And I think you're going to see more consequences here. You know, and some, some of them are going to be good and some of them are going to be bad. But I think, you know, let's go back to that. The, the, what, what lit the bonfire, the immediate bonfire. I mean, two things, you know, obviously this explosion of anti-Semitism, this the shock that I think a lot of liberals felt, you know, when they saw some of the things happening on university campuses and how, you know, after years of saying we need to make these safe spaces that nobody's feeling should be hurt. Suddenly uh, we have these assaults on Jewish students and it was like kind of shrugged off a little bit. So it was the inconsistency. So Claudine Gay and the other presidents go in and they are um, politically tone deaf at the hearing. But I think what really, I, and I, what I think this really turned the spotlight on was the inconsistency. Um, and, you know, our friends at FIRE, um, the free speech organization, rank Harvard, I believe, what is it, 238th out of major last. universities, and dead last. <laughs> and it's because yeah. people like Claudine Gay, have a, I mean, let's be honest about this, a terrible track record of defending diversity of thought. They have canceled uh, scholars who said and did things that were politically unpalatable. Um, There have been, um, you know, instances of intolerance and illiberalism. So when suddenly they tried to, you know, pose for holy pictures about tolerance of, you know, anti-Jewish, any, any Semitism, it rang a ho- hollow. I don't know, have you had a chance to see the, the Washington Post editorial on all of this? 
because I think they, they make some good points. I want to get your reaction to it. Uh, they, they write the resignation of Harvard's president is a chance for schools to learn. And, the, and they point out this inconsistency. Harvard's failing and that of its peer institutions can be summarized in a single word. Inconsistency. Ms. Gay assumed leadership of Harvard in a post-George Floyd cli- climate of racial reckoning as its first black president. A champion of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, she made racial justice on campus a cornerstone of her efforts at Harvard. The institution's leaders spoke clearly and passionately against Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and police abuse after Floyd's death. But when Hamas launched its horrific October 7th massacre of Jews and others in Israel, Ms. Gay and other university presidents did not immediately and forcefully condemn it. To outraged alumni and other critics, Harvard had no dis, uh, had no explanation because if you're going to weigh in on all of these issues, why the silence there? And, and they come to the conclusion the lesson here for Harvard and for other universities is that it's a mistake to create the expectation that university presidents have to weigh in on all the great issues of the day. If administrators, as a matter of principle, avoided pandering to left-wing activists on campus, they would be on firmer ground resisting activist right-wing or otherwise voices off campus. And their claims to respect all speech without, uni- I'm sorry, within uniformly applied time, manner, and place limitations would have more credibility. The business of a great university is not to take sides in America's culture wars. Now, I imagine people say, well, there's some parts of the culture where you should take sides on. But the yeah. reality and the reason why I, 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 I think this is not the tail end is that there has not really been a reckoning of the fact about how illiberal some of these institutions have been, how thoroughly politicized they have been, and how really kind of hermetically sealed the university politics has been to the rest of the world. You step onto a university campus, and he, I'm talking to a veteran professor, but you were at the War College, which would be a little bit different, um, and, and you're in a completely different intellectual environment. And I think they're paying a price for the fact that, you know, centrist, conservative scholars have opted out and don't feel that that is a safe space. So you have that uniformity of thought And I think that's being challenged. I mean, there was going to be a reckoning at some point, and I feel it's hitting now, maybe at the behest of the worst people in the world, but it's not because it's without some reality underlying it. Well, you've piled up a a bunch of issues, and one of them is, let me go back before we leave aside the, um, you know, the extra role Chris Rufo. The one thing that they did that was very clever, I don't really think they cared that much about Claudine Gay or her academic record. What they were trying to do with this whole business was to bait, because this goes back to your point about hypocrisy, Charlie. They were trying to bait the institution into openly defending a double standard instead of being able to kind of elide that. They were trying to bait the school into being openly hypocritical and saying, yes, yes, we defend all of these, you know, issues of academic rigor, um, but not if it's a problem with our people, because our people get a pass. And I hate to say that, you know, for a time they succeeded, that Harvard, you know, they played, I I said this last night on on PBS, they played rope-a-dope with Harvard because they put a little bit out there and got Harvard to defend it as just a nothing burger. Then they put a little more out there and they got, you know, the academic community to start yelling about this is racism. And then they really dropped the big tranche of here's the stuff, you know, unattributed, uh, unattributed plagiarism, et cetera, et cetera. And then everybody had to go quiet and say, oh, crap. Um, But the damage was done. With that said, let me say something about kind of the bubble nature Yes, I, I was at the War College for a lot of years. Remember, I, I was at Harvard every week mm-hmm. and I, you know, taught at Georgetown and Dartmouth in my career. And I gave lectures during the past seven, eight years. I've been lecturing campuses all across the country. Campuses are, a, when you say you walk into a bubble when you walk onto a campus, that's truer if you say when you walk into a campus department. Right. Okay. I, or faculty meeting. Fair. Because, you know, one of the things that's always yeah. striking, the kids are, most of the kids, I mean, obviously not the ones you see, you know, chanting from the river to the sea, but, you know, most of the kids in my experience in 35 years, they're pretty sensible. Yeah. They're a lot more sensible than some of their faculty. 
Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to tell this story from the, from the nineties because I just love it so much. I had a student, really bright kid, one of my advisees at a certain Ivy league school that I, I won't name, but it rhymes with Schmartmouth. All right, fine. So it was at, <laughs> when I was in Dartmouth and this, this advisee said to me, you know, came in and she was doing really poorly in a particular class. And I said, I don't understand this. You know, you're a good student. You get blah, blah, blah. So she went back, comes back to me, you know, for her check-in a few months later, all her grades are fine. And she said, um, yeah, I'm doing great in the class. And I said, good. What happened? Did you talk to professor so-and-so? Did you get, she said, no, I just came, I just realized on every quiz or exam, I had to say something bad about Reagan and I would get an A. Mm. And, you know, I, I laughed. I mean, that's kind of a sad story, but I laughed because she was a sensible young woman who figured it out and she got a perfectly good education and kind of worked her way around this very radical member of the faculty and sort of she learned stuff, you know, this this faculty member taught decent classes, but right. just had this particular Pebbling issue. The kids are like that. They figure stuff out. And they're actually, I would say, again, mostly, mostly um, pretty sensible. I think where the Claudine Gay business comes from was this kind of bubble sensibility. And I think you're absolutely right about the post-George Floyd environment. But again, I, I would say the George Floyd thing, the George Floyd environment, not the George Floyd thing, the the murder was a ghastly mm -hmm. national sin that we're yeah. going to talk about for years. But you notice that how quickly things fizzled out there, you know, police reform gone, defund the police movements dead, um, you know, police violence, not curbed. And, and I think in that environment, there were nonetheless people in the bubble who said, Hey, let's do this thing. And nobody, nobody will question, you know, um, that this president of Harvard has this track record that you talked about, that, you know, there, there might be problems in our CV or that our CV might, or, I'm sorry, our academic resume for non-academic types. Um, you know, they just said, of course we can do this and nobody will question it. And that was, that led to, um, you know, this, this attack. And, uh, and it was a bad faith, nasty, you know, yes, everything she, she said. And I think she wrote a really unfortunate op-ed after yes. she stepped down. Yeah. I think that op-ed uh, playing know, personally, the victim, playing the victim card, basically making it all about um, diversity race. And, 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 and race, which, which certainly did and, not did not acknowledge the scope of of, uh, of yeah. her academic was, misconduct or the double standards it, or it what it would have meant for Harvard Chris if Rufo, they would have stuck with her. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an it's an op-ed that Chris, Chris Rufo could not have hoped for a better op-ed because it played right into to I, every trap laid for her. I think that's um, tragically but, true. No. Well, again, but, as but, but the universities, like I said, the universities are full of kids who actually go, you know what, America, anybody listening to us, those kids are going to graduate and they're going to be fine. Yeah. Well, they, the they, professors they, they are, won't be, but they'll, you know. The reason why I don't think this issue is going to go away is because I think that there are, this is, you know, just one aspect of the crisis of higher education. Um, I think that, you know, it's not just political, it's also about the cost, the, you know, all of the questions about it. And these, th this had been bubbling for a very, very long time. I should remind people that William F, I believe it was William F. Buckley's first book ever was God and Man at Yale. So the conservative critique of higher education has been going on for a long time. And even before, you know, in the, in the before times, people were raising questions about higher education <laughs> and about universities here. And um, in case anybody wants to, this is actually still in print. Fail you, the false promise of higher education from the author of Prof Scam and Dumbing Down Our Kids. So there's a lot going on. Some of us have been writing about it for a very, very long time. And so I look at this going like, <clears throat> wow, this uh, this this fire has been smoldering and somebody just came and they threw uh, they threw kerosene on it and then somebody threw a stick of dynamite on it. So I wish there was yet. as much debate about those issues as there are. And, you know, this is where I think the right wing has completely stumbled for short term tactical gains rather than, you know, making the country a better place, because as a you know conservative professor in the liberal academy, um, I, I was very concerned about the fact that, for example, um, standards in general everywhere have fallen. I mean, mm -hmm. it is just easier to get through college now right. 
then even in in my you know i went in the 70s and the 80s um and i i could tell you that in the 40 years you know what now for oh crap i don't even want to say this out loud the 45 years since i started college um students can't read as much they just won't they don't have the patience for it grade inflation is rampant i talk about this it has been for some time again i You know, I talk about this in the death of expertise that students graduate from college saying, well, I had an A minus average at a at a at a university. Well, which may not mean very much anymore. And I think, you know, this obsession with DEI, which is a a tiny corner of what happens at most universities, has really let the universities off the hook for the fact, for example, the foreign language training has collapsed. This is I I would argue this is one of the most gigantic stories, one of the most gigantic unreported stories, I guess now that I write for a magazine, I should probably write about it, but I've been busy. Um, but the collapse of language training is uh, a huge you're, part you're, of you're what's trig- happened you're, at you're, university. You're triggering me here because for 30 years, <clears throat> it, it has struck me as one of the great ironies is that at the very moment when we decided is as, as a country that we were, you know, needed to embrace multiculturalism and it was important that multiculturalism be part of education we stopped requiring kids to learn foreign languages. You want to talk about multiculturalism. How about teaching people about not just about other cultures, but how to speak the language and everything. I mean, it just seemed, it seemed bizarre, but of course, you know, that would be true of so many different fields. And let's, let's move on here because I want to take a beat. But there is one other thing that you raised about the Washington post editorial where they said, you know, universities and their presidents, you know, they don't need to take big stands on the issues of the day, but Charlie, you're, you made the point that, they do need to take some sides in the culture war. And I go back to thinking when I was in college, <clears throat> when you and I were in school, back when, you know, um, Tyrannosaurus roamed the yeah. earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, schools took, I mean, there was no, there was no place in America that was really like neutral on the Cold War, right? Right. You didn't have schools saying, hey, um, eh, Soviet communism, a democracy. Yeah, we don't really take positions yeah. on these right. things. There was this sense that you educate people for citizenship and duty in a democracy to be educated participants right. in the democratic, co- you know. Oh, yeah. And I think <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why the the October 7th, you know, the Hamas outpouring on some of these campuses um, is is really upsetting because these are not students that, you know, it's bad enough that the universities just stood back and said, well, you know, Jew hatred is just one of many things we tolerate. Um, but but that these students are are not equipped to be participants in a in a um, in a deliberative, tolerant, secular, liberal democracy. They're just not right uh, now. Maybe they'll grow out of it. That's the other thing I will just while I, we can move on from this. But I will say, yeah. having taught for 35 years, um, pe- one of the things I think I've come to realize about America is that young people grow out of their radicalism. Old people grow into their radicalism. Interesting. Um, in current, in you know, the way America is structured now, that you know, people there's a kind of a big sensible middle of people that they kind of grow out of this juvenile. I when I wrote about the anti-Semitism, <clears throat> I called it the juvenile viciousness of campus anti-Semitism, and a lot of those kids will outgrow it, and they may even feel some shame later. God, God well, willing, they will. But so yeah. I think they're mostly the kids are going to be all right, but but some of them are not going to be equipped for participation in a in a in a global democracy. Okay, I, I, I have one one last comment on all of this because I have written you know several books about higher education and in uh, each one of them, and I am at pains to uh, to make this case. Each one of them is a defense of liberal education, Small the, human, the humanities. And academic freedom, which is not a conservative position. And I think that that's one of the key points here is that um, that that liberal education means that people should come to campus going, hey, there are all these ideas out there. I need to keep my mind open. I'm going to be exposed to ideas that I've never seen before that challenge my priors, that make me think. The moment you begin to say, no, wait, I am triggered by ideas that I don't like, that I've never heard before, that make me feel unsafe. You have attacked the fundamental foundations of liberal education. You know, if you want a place where you will never hear anything you disagree with, a university campus should stay be the home. last place. You should stay home or go into a monastery or something. You should avoid public transportation and 
higher education because higher education should be about reading books that go, wow, I never thought that, or here's a completely different point of view. You know, when you begin create a culture in which you say, you cannot say that, or I'm going to judge you by your identity rather by, than by your ideas, then again, that is illiberal. So again, that but I, I have to fight you on this about being conservative. Because I think one of the things that came after the 1960s, that's why when you say liberal yeah. education, I, I say small L. Right, I think definitely that, liberal, right. That pre-60s, liberals and conservatives were just two siblings in the same family of Western enlightenment. Correct. What And what happened, I think, on a lot of campuses and, and what we've been trying to get our arms around now, when I think of conser the conservative approach to education, the, the, sm the small c, virtuous conservatives that used to exist before the Rufos and the activists and all these other nitwits. The question, philosophy, right? Lovers of truth. What is true? You go to college and what you're trying to sort out is what do people believe? What does the world look like? And what are things that are true or not true? And how do I think about great truth? How do I engage in moral reasoning? How do I, you know, square the circles of what I believe with what other people believe and so on? I think we're, the progressives went off the rails was to say, first of all, truth is um, whatever you think it is. There's this kind of postmodern derailing of, of truth, right? That says, well, you know, the text is what you bring to the text because everything's about you. Yeah. But more importantly, more importantly, what's true is less important than what serves causes. That's right. Like, you know, there are things that are just true, whether you like them or not. And I think for a lot of people after, you know, the the 60s or, or early 70s was, yeah, there are things that are true. But remember, we have a duty here to progress, to history, to the cause, to move. You know, and I think conservatives are the ones who said, listen, I don't, I don't at least this was my experience as a younger person. Like, look, at, I don't care what serves history or your cause or this or that. I just care about what's empirically true. And of course, that became known as, you know, this, the, I remember somebody, one of my colleagues, when I was a younger scholar, he said, well, you're, you're a total positivist. Like it was an insult, you know, like to be somebody who kind of, you know, believes in, in empirical reality and, and so on. But again, nine ninety percent of that stuff um, in the end ends up not touching the kids. I think the bigger problem with the, for the, for the students, and then you know, we can both get off our pedestal here because we're we're in heated agreement yeah. is that um, they're just not challenged enough. They're not made to think no. they're not made to work. Um, you know, you can get when I when I taught all those years at Dartmouth and realized that, wow, you can graduate from an Ivy League school and never read the Constitution, never well, read it, Shakespeare. It, it, you know, it, I mean, it, 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 it no, it, it, well, it, it is insane. Um, and I was saying that back in the 1980s. What I don't think that we all anticipated was the degree to which, you know, many of those attitudes would seep out and dominate the rest of the culture, the, the wider culture. So we were having this debate about what was happening on university campuses. And now those same debates are taking place in businesses and boardrooms, you know, throughout throughout society. This idea that you shouldn't be challenged or that you are looking for safe spaces has, in fact, you know, seeped out into the culture. The The number of people on just, I mean, you see the comment sections, you get all this stuff who think I'm, I'm not going to read you because, you know, you said something that I disagreed with, as opposed to this is why I disagree with you. And here's my point of view. It, it has become kind of almost a reflex. Okay. I, we need, we need to move on. I'm going to take a beat here okay. because I think there's, there's another sort of big orange elephant in the room here that some of my colleagues, some of our colleagues at the bulwark have made. And I think it is an important point. We're talking about Harvard saying at some point, look, um, even if this allegation comes from the worst people in the world, um, the academic conduct is real. We have standards um, and we are going to enforce those standards because otherwise, what are we if we don't have high standards? And I keep coming back to the fact now we're going to make a complete political switch, even though I said we weren't going to do this. You know, it is interesting that once again, this does serve to highlight the fact that in our culture, Every institution has a standard that it enforces with the exception of the presidency of the United States that we are hold, we hold the millions of Americans, including many of the people who are crowing over the defenestration of Claudine Gay, have no problem taking someone like Donald Trump with Donald Trump's character and misconduct and making him not the president of Harvard, but the president of the United States. 
And I keep coming back to this. Donald Trump, you know, no branch of the military would would trust him with a position of of power and trust. No university, no corporation that he doesn't own, no corporation (laughs) would put him on the board. Nobody would hire him to teach your schools. You wouldn't hire him to. I mean, this is one of those this disconnect here. And I wrote for your publication about this, how if you apply, if you if you try to put Donald Trump into any other you know, part of life, would would people, even conservatives in red states, would they want Donald Trump to be the coach of their kids? Soccer team. They would they want Donald, <laughs> people would not trust Donald Trump yeah, dog walker. with their car keys if he were the valet in front of a restaurant. So this is this is part of the problem, and it's sort of I, I, again the, the that double standard. Um, and you know, others and JVL made made this point. You know that y- you can't take someone seriously who says yes, this is great that Claudine Gay you know has been removed because of her misconduct, and if those same people then turn around and say but I'm supporting Donald Trump to be president of the United States. And don't talk to me about standards or morality or right and wrong or, you know, virtue. But Charlie, None of that why, really matters is, to you, right? None of it. This is why I was so hard over because I think people like Stefanik, like Elise Stefanik, yeah. were desperate to get the academy, to get the elites, right? To get the yeah. beyond pensants, to get the, the editorial pages of the papers to double and triple and quadruple down on Claudine Gay so that then she could say, aha, what about ism is a real thing. And none of you have the moral standing to ever criticize Donald Trump again because nothing really matters. And because everybody is corrupt and we're all, you know, terrible people, you, me, and everybody else. And I think that was why I was kind of banging the desk here about don't take this the bait. bait. The way that you defend standards is to defend standards. The way that you defend the rule of law is to observe the rule of law. The way that you uh, defend the Constitution is to observe the Constitution. And our friends on the left, you've you've gotten you've taken these face shots before. Why do we always have to be the good ones? Why do we have to be the people who obey the rules? Because that's how it works. That's because why. Otherwise, because that's how it, it the, happens. Otherwise, the nihilists win. Win. Because exactly. the project, once you basically invested in Donald Trump, it's not just Trump. You have to destroy. You have to have this long march through all of the standards, all of the norms, all of the institutions to say that, well, Everyone is corrupt. Nothing matters. Everyone's a liar. Everybody is a crook. Um, everybody engages, violates the Espionage Act. Everybody engages in racketeering, right? Because once once it's, it's everybody does it, then you can rationalize your support for Donald Trump. So the support for Donald Trump has had this incredible impact on the culture and character, not just of presidential politics, but again, Everywhere. what does Elise Stefanik want to do? Elise Stefanik wants to discredit any pocket that might say we actually represent integrity or standards. You have to, you have to burn them all down. Right. In order Elise to Stefanik it. wants to stay in Washington. She wants to live in the Emerald City. And mm-hmm. if that means that saying everybody in America is basically a liar and a cheat and a double dealer, then so be it. If that's if 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 the way to do that is to say that America's culture is one big sewer, and I'm no worse than any other, you know, floating piece of of garbage in that sewer, then so be it. And that Americans should absolutely reject that kind of nihilist, um, you know, lowest common denominator leveling. But that is what's behind a lot of this stuff. That is not people are getting sucked into inane arguments about DEI and about, you know, what really, you know, is it, is, is what gay did worse than what so-and-so did. The, the, you know, one of the things I was thinking while you were saying this, Charlie, is that um, a lot of our former comrades on the right who now are that we refer to on block as the anti anti Trumpers, right? Yes. The people on the right who are mad at people like you and me for mm-hmm. breaking with, um, with, with the right about Donald Trump. They're, they're, um, their complaints are 90%. I, I mean, when I write things, they rarely complain about the substance of it. They just want to say, they say, but you used to be one of us. So you're a hypocrite. You're a liar. You're a, you're, you know, a double dealer, double standards, because that's the only way to defang all of these 
you know, it's like right. if if you if if I can prove that you didn't stand on principle, I can prove that no one stands on principle, and therefore nothing matters. I'm not that's such exactly a bad guy, right. and if Donald Trump wins, that's just the way it goes. And I think people need to be just be aggressive in rejecting that and saying, look, none of us are completely consistent in our views. We are human beings. We, you know, we, 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 we think we reconsider, we change our minds, but in the end, you know, no, I do not. I will not defend the behavior of someone like Trump in one of my guys, just because it's my guy. No matter who it is, whether you know, no matter what politician it is, and that's um, hard. You know, right? I mean, let, let, let's Bob acknowledge Menendez, it's, right? It's, it's I mean, hard, you know, right. like you know, yeah. I, you don't see. I mean, I I haven't written my Bob Menendez must stay piece. You know, I mean, Bob yeah. Menendez. Th- th- anybody else would have quit by now, and this is you know an ongoing tragedy uh, for the Democrats. I mean, it's, I shouldn't even call it a tragedy; it's an ongoing embarrassment. But but you know, again, to get baited into, well, what about Trump? What about what they did? What about if you're going to defense, the whole point of standards is that they are not amenable to what aboutist arguments, which is why Trumpists make the what about arguments every 10 seconds. See, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Menendez case because, you know, Menendez and others, and he's not, this is not personal about him, but you can tell that there's an entire political class now that is sort of testing the, you know, testing the winds, you know, have all of the rules of politics, have all of the rules of moral gravity been repealed? Can I now because of Trump, can I get away with things that would have been disqualifying a few years ago? And you can just see this with with, you know, people like, you know, Matt Gates and others or or, or even I, I, right. I think. Yeah, no, they're I mean, right. I, I think, I, you know, I and, and they well, we're going to find out because, you know, sometimes we find out that the rules only apply to Donald Trump. They don't apply to to anybody else. But you can just tell that th- there is a class of politicians that just thinks, first of all, you know, in the old days, if if the local newspaper, you know, exposed my corruption, I would be done. Now, um, I can simply attack the newspaper, figure the people will never hear this information, I and raise it, and I can I can play the victim card. So, one of the things that we are testing now is how what is the blast radius of this? Nothing matters. It's Trump and other people, and you know, there's one of the reasons why the worst people in the world. Uh, try to shelter under the wings of Donald Trump's amorality because they think this also gives them a lifetime hall pass from accountability. And it's kind of exciting for many of them. They've they've learned from Trump that it it won't always work, but it's at least worth a shot to tough it out. Right. Because what's the worst that could happen? And that's the kind of reasoning that you can only engage in if you don't feel shame. Right. You know, so I was watching um, oh, I was watching shame. an episode of uh, Mad Men the other day. I've been re-binging <laughs> Mad Men. You know, like I've been hi- taking refuge in the past mm-hmm. from our unpleasant present right now. And um, um, they made reference to the Profumo scandal. And for you youngins out there, the Minister of Defense got caught it's sleeping with a call girl yeah. who was also, shall we say, um, boinking. Somebody at the Soviet will, embassy. Will, will, will it shock you that I know her name? Christine Keeler. Chris, Christine Keeler. They made a movie Which, about by it. the way, dates both of us here. But okay, yes. go on. <laughs> yes. And with the lovely Joanne Wally in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we digress. And um, Profumo, when he was discovered, said, this was a terrible error in judgment. I resign. And then he spent the rest of his life in charitable work. Mm-hmm. He, he dropped out of pub. You know, he was a peer. and you mm-hmm. know, But when he died... People spoke incredibly well of him because he had spent 50 years basically doing good in part as a penance for this gigantic screw up that embarrassed his country and, you know, hurt his family and all of this other stuff. Nobody does that anymore. But, you know, it's like, so, uh, you know, so I got caught doing bad things. I'll just I'll just say, so what? And what about what about the other people? And, who and did maybe it? I'll, and maybe I'll it? maybe I'll end up as a as an anchor on Newsmax or One America Now if there's if that's the <laughs> or or you know or maybe as a maybe as a member of Congress or in in uh, president a, a, of the United States or a member of the cabinet because yes yeah, so oh so on that note our first podcast of the first weekend wow twenty twenty four Tom. With all of that, too much of a bum out, Charlie. 
No. Let's go back to the good economic news. At least there's that. Well, that is extraordinary because, you know, among the, you know, all the doom casting of 2023, the center of that was always, you know, how terrible the economy was and how we were headed into a recession and how low the chances of a soft, uh, soft landing were. Oh, yeah. Soft um, recovery. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Um, the experts, the experts can't pull that off. <laughs> you well, know, uh, is, is this a reason I, I Tom, somebody... to be skeptical of experts? I I think that the problem was that, you know, the experts said if we, with enough discipline at the Fed and, you know, stay the course, right? This is this whole last period has been very, uh, you know, you'll appreciate this because I kept thinking this is a kind of a Reaganite moment. Stay the course, stay the course. They're going to keep, you know, they're hurting the market, but they're keeping the interest rates low. And there were there were experts who said this is possible. It's unlikely and the cards all have to kind of fall into the right place. Um, and for political reasons, there were a lot of people who said, no, no, the economy is you know, going to be horrible forever. And it's just not. And look, there are still problems, right? The housing market hasn't cooled off. Um, there's still that kind of lock with people that don't want to sell houses. There's not enough housing stock. But by and large, in the things that, that we would have once called the misery index, how many people are unemployed, how high are interest rates, how bad is inflation? This is as good an economy, um, and you know I keep wanting to say, and therefore Biden's doomed. Um, you know, like the you know, like the New York Times might say, um, but it is great economic news. I mean, that well, I'm, I'm sorry. When did we start thinking that you know three percent inflation and three and a half four percent unemployment? Because anything lower, we get a labor shortage. Um, you know, six and a half seven percent mortgages. And, um, you know, the stock market crashing through new highs. When did that become bad news? Yeah, and I no, think it's I, just this kind of, you know, we just like it's it's almost I called it I wrote a piece. I called it political and economic hypochondria. <laughs> well, I mean, there are some people concerned about the interest rates, but I, I know I, I agree with you. And I, I think that's why today's numbers were so significant, because I, th I think there's a there's a lag. There's a lag time from the economic numbers to when the public actually begins to, you know, internalize it. And it doesn't take one month or two months. You know, it takes, it takes a period. Um, I think, I think it was Josh Crashauer who said, you know, these are very good numbers going into the first quarter of 2024. And the first quarter is when people's attitudes towards the economy get baked in. They're not baked mm. in yet, but if you have yeah. more months like this, people go, yeah, you know, um, this is pretty, this is pretty remarkable that we have this kind, because in my lifetime, it's hard to imagine, um, you know, thinking that this low in unemployment rate is bad. The inflation is a huge problem, but it appears to be moderating. The fact that we're doing this, this at the same time is rather extraordinary. Okay. So we did end on a positive note after all, Tom. Rolling say into, something positive. It's rolling into the, the weekend. So, Tom, thank you for uh, coming back on the podcast, and welcome to 2024. Thanks, Charlie. Happy New Year. And thank you all for listening to this weekend's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday, and we will do this all over again.